This is TTT Live. I'm Mahalia Joseph Wharton. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another Ministry of Health virtual media conference. These media conferences are intended for you, the public, to hear directly from the medical subject matter experts themselves. We remain committed to providing you with relevant, accurate, and up-to-date information on the national COVID-19 response. Our panelists today are the Honorable Terence Yal Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health, and Ms. Salisha Baksh, CEO, Northwest Regional Health Authority. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and your moderator for this morning's program. We begin with an opening statement from the Minister of Health. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, my colleague, uh, C CEO uh, Salisha Bash, Northwest RHA. Good morning to ladies and gentlemen of the media and to the listening and viewing public wherever you are. A good Wednesday morning to you. Uh, before I go into the local position on where we are with the national rollout of our vaccination plan, phases one and two, it is an opportune time to remind the country where the world is at with COVID-19. One of the statistics I started to give the country on the 24th of, of October 2020, last year October, um, it was at one of the press conferences held in Tobago. At that time, there were seven countries in the world um, which had reported COVID cases of 1 million plus. We are now um, for six months later, six to seven months later, and the number of countries reporting 1 million plus cases is now 26. The global pandemic, as you have seen, in the global context, is not slowing down. At this point in time, I think we should all have um, India in our thoughts and prayers. And... Uh, send our best wishes to the government and people of India um, for what they are facing. Vaccination is one of the other tools in the armory of a population in how to manage and control the spread of COVID-19. You may recall that in Trinidad and Tobago, we received an initial gift from the government of Barbados of 2,000 doses. We then received our first batch of uh, vaccines to the COVAX facility of 33,600. And then a gift from the government of India, people and government of India, after the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, wrote to his counterpart, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India, we got in another 40,000 doses. If the math is correct, it means that we had 75,600 doses um, for distribution. Bearing in mind that it's a two-dose regime, we could not distribute all 75,600. Because being a two-dose regime, you have to have your first shot, and then we must keep doses in reserve for persons who have received their first shot to get their second shot. In the early days, we were talking about using the COVAX vaccines of 33,600, if you remember, to maybe vaccinate 17,000 persons, which was half of that amount. The receipt of the 40,000 doses from India meant that we could vaccinate two and a half times that amount. To date, we have vaccinated 41,802 persons, which is a phenomenal feat. And what has gone unrecognized in all of this is the hard work and dedication 
and high degree of customer service. That congratulatory messages have been posted online, have been coming to me and others about the wonderful customer service that people got in delivering this 41,802 doses of vaccines across the system. So I really want to thank, once again, healthcare workers for rising to the challenge. Your good work has not gone unnoticed. As we said last week, we would have to start to wind down the vaccination program because we can't keep on after this 41, 42,000 because we have to keep doses in reserve for those people who have been vaccinated. From day one, with the 2,000 doses we got from uh, Barbados, you would recall that we had a very pleasant supply, uh, surprise, really, when we were able to vaccinate over 1,000 persons. I think the exact number was around 1,152 because the vials actually had more than 10 doses um, per vial. We noticed the same thing with the AstraZeneca packaging. So with 75,600 and with the extra doses we are getting, if we use a range of between 10 to 15% more doses, it meant that we had in country a 10% overage, 83,160, which meant if we divide that by two, and if my math is correct, we could have vaccinated 41,580 persons. If we use an upper limit of 15% overage from 75,600, <clears throat> it then goes up to 86,940, which means we could vaccinate 43,470. So we are right in the middle of that 10 to 15% overage rate where we have vaccinated 41,802. In winding down, we would have said since last week, that we will be bringing up appointments and vaccinating those who have confirmed appointments, and we have done that. There are only a couple hundred um, persons still to be vaccinated. In Trinidad, Southwest has about 200 that will be done today. And in Tobago, there are some uh, couple hundred again. They will finish that by the end of this week. So this phase of the vaccination program is winding down and has one want gone down in ERHA, North Central RHA, Northwest RHA. Just Tobago and South RHA still have to clean up their outstanding, their outstanding amounts. The message to the public is this. One, thank you. Thank you for your response. It has been phenomenal. For those wishing to make um, to make appointments for future vaccinations. COVAX has confirmed that we will be receiving another 33,600 doses in May. When we have that confirmed date and a confirmed date to start that phase, persons can then start to make their appointments. Please don't make appointments now. Um, that is not how we are op operating because we don't have a start date. We can't give you a start date. Once we receive the vaccines and we know the expiry dates, as usual, we will communicate with the members of the public so that they can make their appointments. So the, the message for now, we have wound down. Um, don't make appointments now. We will give the country the go ahead as to when we make appointments for that 33,600, depending on how we plan to use it. So that is where we are with our vaccination drive. It has been incredibly successful. In closing, I cannot thank healthcare workers enough. I visited about 12 sites over the past couple of weeks, interacted with patients, and I will tell you without fear of contradiction, I have had not had one customer complaint in any of the centers. I made sure to ask our clients who are either waiting to be vaccinated or waiting for the, um, for the 30 minutes to pass. And there was not one single customer complaint. 
So we must thank our healthcare workers. This first phase of the vaccination program has gone very well. I thank the public for their response and more vaccines are on the way and we will notify the public as to when they could start to make appointments to take advantage of that other second tranche of COVAX vaccines of 33,600. Thank you very much, Al. Back over to you. Great news. Thank you, Minister. I now hand you over to the CMO, who will present the latest clinical and epidemiological update. Right. Good morning. Thank you, Al. And good morning to the Honourable Minister. Good morning to the CEO of Northwest, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So I'll begin with the first slide, which is the clinical update for as of 4 p.m. the 27th of April, 2021. So at both public and private sector, you can see the to total number of tests completed and conducted thus far, 128,988. Over the last 24-hour period, there was 151 new positives returned giving us a grand total of 9,947 cases as positive to date. Of those, total recovered patients are 8,281, and an active case load of 1,505 spread between, of course, the hospitals and the community sites. At the home isolation sites, we have 1,192, 161 deaths in total, and 152 patients in hospital. At our step-down facilities, we have 10 persons, and as of 4 p.m., we have 243 persons in state quarantine, an updated figure as of this morning, 199 in that regard. So I'll break down a little bit the hospital occupancy, so where we have those 152 patients. So the 152 patients represent an overall hospital occupancy of 58% at this time, ICU 27%, and HDU 12%. So at the Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, we have 97 people, 6 in ICU, 10 in HDU. At the Cora Hospital, 26 persons. And at the Scarborough Regional Hospital at Fort King George, there are 29 persons. So I, if we could go into my first slide, second slide, sorry. So my second slide is, is trying to break down again the total active cases. Right, and this gives you an idea of the percentages that are covered based on geographic location if we start in st george west we say sorry okay so this this is actually a just a graphical um, demonstration of what we will go into the second slide so we could finish with this one and go back to the first one um so st george west 10.5 percent st george central 12.9 percent st george east 15.3 st andrews st david remains very low 2.8 percent as as is tobago at 2.8 percent Victoria 22.9 and County Kearney 18.2 account for in, in combination just over 40 percent. St. Patrick 12 percent and the River Miaro still a little bit low as well 2.6 percent. Go back into the first one and then we go to the third slide. If you could go backwards and show the map so it based yeah. So when the map comes back up what we'll see is a geographic distribution by actual case numbers in the country so just as we did the percentages before, you will see, we starting in St. George West, we see the actual numbers of persons distributed in the various counties, 141 in St. George West, 173 in St. George Central, 205 in St. George East, 38 in St. Andrew St. David, 245 County Kearney, 308 in Victoria, 161 in St. Patrick, Nereva Mayaro 35, and Tobago 37. So we're going to the skip the second slide and go forward. Yeah, so the other slide that we were going to discuss after that, of course, is the male to female pattern. And again, as we saw before, so comorbidities, 60.3%, those without comorbidities, and 39.7% with comorbidities. Next slide should give you the male to female. So we go forward, please. So the next slide, of course, as we have noted throughout the pandemic the male to female ratio has more or less been 50 50 and in this particular side it actually shows when we go forward to it that the majority of people are actually now 50 50 exactly in terms of the calculation so 50 percent male 50 percent female the next slide yeah so this gives clinical case disposition meaning where are you at now um, in terms of hospitals so 
the percentage transferred to hospital 5.5%, those symptomatic at 34.0%, those asymptomatic at 57.3%. Next slide. So this is breaking down your comorbidities further. Again, we see diabetes and hypertension being the, the two most prominent comorbidities that we have seen throughout the pandemic. 22.7% of persons presenting with diabetes, 25.9% hypertension, 2.8% heart disease, and of course pulmonary issues including asthma, 14.7%, immune deficiencies at 14.3%, asthma, sorry, 15.5%, and other comorbidities at 2.4%. Um, pregnancy, as we have always said, is not a comorbidity, but it is an at-risk state where you have a vulnerable population, and that number of persons infected is now at 1.6%. Next slide. So the last slide just breaks down in terms of percentage of age um, as to those who are infected, and we're starting on the left, 0 to 19, 7.07%, which is very low. Um, actually, it's pretty low as compared to what we have seen previously in the pandemic, which is a good sign. 32.64% those 20 to 39 and 33.09 those 40 to 59. So that middle age group 20 to 59 again, accounting for the majority of persons being infected. 60 to 79, 16.05% and above 80, 11.15%. So I believe that's the last slide, Al, and brings me to the end of the clinical update for today. Thank you very much, CMO. I now hand you over to Ms. Bash will provide us with an update on the vaccination uptake in the NWRHA, particularly the work being done at the mass vaccination sites at the Queen's Park Savannah. Ms. Bash. Honorable Minister of Health, Chief Medical Officer, Mr. Alexander, members of the listening and viewing public, media personnel, good morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide an update to the public in relation to the mass vaccination exercise which was conducted at the Queen's Park, Savannah, the paddock particularly, over the last four days, meaning Thursday to Sunday. I would like to firstly indicate that this exercise was a huge success as we would have vaccinated over 6,000 persons in four days. It was very well organized and that is to no small measure to the various organizations we would have, we would have partnered with. Uh, just as a background, last Monday, the Ministry of Health would, would have reached out to NWRHA uh, requesting that we operationalize the Queen's Park Savannah for a four-day period uh, for a mass vaccination program. Through the tireless work of the NWRHA COVID team, we were able to operationalize that site within two days. And uh, over that 40 day period, we vaccinated 6,343 persons, which are disaggregated as follows. On Thursday, 716 persons were vaccinated. Friday, 1,216. Saturday, 2,037. And Sunday, 2,374. The site was... Uh, operationalized on Thursday and Friday between the hours of 8 to 4 p.m., which is an eight-hour period. And on the weekend, we would have functioned from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is a 10-hour a, a, a period. On the Thursday and Friday, we would have manned 10 vaccination stations, whereas on the sun, Saturday and Sunday, we would have facilitated 16 vaccination stations. The increase in the stations would have obviously allowed us to vaccinate more persons concurrently. And that would account for the larger numbers that we would have vaccinated over the Saturday and the Sunday period. An enormous exercise such as this can only be successful if we have sufficient manpower. And as I mentioned before, we would have partnered with various organizations who all assisted in this initiative. And I need to mention them this morning because a great deal of gratitude goes out to them. So firstly, I would like to thank the Honorable Minister of Health and his team at the Ministry for their continuous support over that 40-day period. The Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service, they were instrumental in their team members ushering persons throughout each stage of the process. And this really accounted for the smooth and continuous flow of patients throughout the entire day as we aim to vaccinate as much persons as we can. And they also provided medical support and emergency ambulance services. 
the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force provided medics who would have assisted at our screening stations, and their security team would have assisted in crowd control and securing the site. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service uh, assisted us in controlling the large crowds that were gathering outside of the paddock area, and they were instrumental in ensuring that there was an orderly fashion of persons entering the site. The Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association, in collaboration with the Trinidad and Tobago Nursing Association, provided staff for the weekend activities, both on Saturday and Sunday, and their staff would have assisted in all stages of the process, from the screening stations to vaccination stations to the observation area. Without their partnership, we would not have been able to vaccinate the large numbers on the weekend, as you have seen from the numbers that I um, shared with you before. The NWRHA's medical doctors, both junior and senior doctors, supported this initiative each day, and they volunteered their service tirelessly, and they must be congratulated and thanked because they as well assisted us in achieving the type of numbers that we have achieved over the four-day period. The, NWR, the NWRHA staff, from the entrance tent to the cleaners who ensured that there was continuous sanitization at each stage of the process, the ushers for ensuring that persons were moving from each station in a seamless transition and an orderly fashion, I must thank each and every one of them. The NWRH COVID team, who worked 12 to 16 hour days for the last week to ensure this exercise was a success. There aren't enough words I can say to express my gratitude for them. And lastly, the National Carnival Commission for allowing us the use of the paddock at the Queen's Park Savannah. Uh, the site was perfect in terms of its size to accommodate the type of numbers that we were hoping to be able to facilitate. And in closing, I just want to emphasize that vaccinating over 6,000 persons in four days in an orderly fashion is certainly not an easy feat by any stretch of the imagination. However, the success of this exercise is a testament that Trinidad and Tobago can achieve anything once there's teamwork. So I just want to urge each and every one of us to continue to support Team Trinidad and Tobago in our fight against the COVID-19 virus. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Bash. As we move into our question and answer segment, a reminder to our media representatives to begin by stating your name and your media house before you put forward your questions to our presenters. Please, no more than two brief questions at this time. And if time permits, we will accommodate one question from each media house. We begin with CL Communications. Good morning, Naveen Singh, Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. I just wanted to find out to what extent is England assisting this country with, with testing and how much is it costing um, Trinidad? And the second question is, to what extent is Israel assisting Trinidad and Tobago since uh, CMO had indicated um, a few press conferences ago that Israel uh, was doing extremely well and Trinidad was looking in, uh, in that direction to see what they had gotten correct. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I will take, sorry, I will take the first one about England. So what England, what public health England has committed to do was to provide technical support to the University of the West Indies to enable them to ramp up their genomic sequencing. It's not testing. It's genomic sequencing and it's a partnership between Public Health England and the University of the West Indies. Okay, thank you. CMO? Yeah, so, so we did have a, a sort of um, technical collaborative meeting a couple of weeks ago with Israel, just to see, of course, how they had set up their vaccination program, how they had done their sites, to really get to some granular um, levels in terms of the operational plans that they used. All, all things being equal, I think um, it was a good technical meeting that we had and we were able to share ideas going both both ways um, but of course the, ge the general premise of it Israel used mostly the Pfizer vaccine as is well known in the public domain and they had a very large supply of that vaccine that was available to them and of course the uptake was good in the population I don't think they can point out to us at least in the presentation um, what was the key success factors in, in getting people to take the vaccine you know so I think it really is, you know, there's some independent, there's cultural aspects to vaccine uptake as well. 
So we really have to learn from the lessons of anyone we can um, across the world and see how the uptakes have gone. We see in parts of Europe, although they have vaccines, that people are not taking it. So it really depends on the climate in the country, the culture of the country, and we have been trying to, to determine what are the factors that would lead to best uptake in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, once the vaccines get here, we target the, the populations as the phases have been outlined and we go from there. So we did have the meeting and it was, um, I think, good technical collaboration as we have had with other countries in the world. Thank you, CMO. Guardian Media, you are up next. Hi, good morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my first question is to both the CMO and the minister. Um, could you just give us an idea, now that we're uh, winding down the vaccination, uh, this first part of the vaccination program, how much of our most vulnerable population was able to access those vaccines? So those with the comorbidities, the elderly, all those um, persons. And my second question is to you, uh, Minister Dial Singh. Could you give us an update on, to, uh, on the policy uh, that the Bar Owners Association would have suggested to the government when it comes to banning the consumption of alcohol in public spaces? Now, I know the Attorney General spoke a little bit about it yesterday, but I get the impression that he, came, um, that he was speaking more about the sale of alcohol as opposed to the consumption of alcohol. Thank you very much, Rashad. Um, so, of the, it's a good thing I ran, I ran these rough numbers before I came. So, of the 41,802 vaccines delivered in a meeting we had with the CEOs yesterday morning, I meet with them every Tuesday morning, we had identified 5,000 frontline healthcare workers. On average, across the RHAs, they told me yesterday, roughly 50% of those frontline healthcare workers have been vaccinated. So that's 2005. Outside of the NCD cohort, so for example, local government, um, parliamentarians, um, judiciary, um, some persons in defense force and so on, that will be about another 2,005 to 3,000. So that's about 5,500 roughly non-NCD persons. Therefore, if you take away 5,005 from 41,000, if my math is correct, you'll get about 35, 36,000. So roughly, rough count, back of envelope count, we have vaccinated about 36,000 persons over 60, out of the 41,000, which is a pretty good uptake for which I am grateful. Thank you very much, Rashad. On the question of the bar owners and their proposals, I spoke with the um, AG up to last night. He has indicated to me that the legislation required to give life to what the bar owners um, association, what the association has suggested, is going to require three-fifths majority legislation as it infringes on many rights under the Constitution. So at this point in time, that may be a non-starter. Thank you very much, Rashad. And thank you, Minister. We now go to TTT. We're ready for your questions. Hi, good morning, Sonal Lala, TTT News. Uh, question to the Minister. Uh, with regards to genomic sequencing for the variants, um, correct me if I'm strong, but um, has it been random something so far? And can you see if the need arises or any suspicion uh, for a positive case to undergo genetic sequencing if this can be done? And secondly, um, we've got reports into the newsroom that uh, some persons have been tested positive at, uh, I think it's Riverside Plaza or Government Plaza. Uh, employees are uh, apparently uh, who work there are concerned that they're not being told of the, uh, the, of the positive cases and concerns that the building is also not being sanitized. Can you say? Uh, what is the policy of the government buildings if, if there are positive cases? Does this require employees to be informed of a case and uh, or business, uh, sorry, the bu buildings being sanitized as well? So these are good technical questions and I will let the CMO uh, respond to them. Yeah, so the, the first one in terms of the, the way the samples are sent for genetic sequencing. When we had just started the, the process of sequencing, which um, Professor Carrington has confirmed, which was December last year, 
we were sending all samples that came back as positive from the repatriated group as a first tier. Um, of course, looking at that particular group as a very high risk group in terms of possibly getting variants out of them. And as you have known from the repatriates, we got actually two B117, which is the UK variant coming out of that particular group. We added to that um, some community samples of, of persons um, some persons from the migrant population that we thought may have been at risk. So that was added a couple of months after the initial start. To that, we have recently added uh, a group of hospital persons. So persons who are presented at a younger age group with unusual signs, um, being admitted to ICU HDO, for example, with younger, in young, younger persons with little comorbidities. So we have added that group as a third tier where we can actually send those to, for sequencing as well. And I have always um, said to my CM, which is that they have some level of discretion. As the last question I would have pointed out, we do have that discretion to say if we see an unusual case by way of clinical presentation or otherwise, that it is flagged to Trinidad Public Health Lab, which goes to CAFA, and then of course UV does the sequence for us. So that is with regards to your first question, how we do it. Um, it is not, it is random of a defined population, of a defined sampling methodology. So random in that regard. The government plaza, what we do with any person that is infected or positive in any any building, whether it be private or public, is that the CMOH will be in contact with the the owners of that establishment, whether it be government or, or private, to determine what is the best way forward to determine who are the primary, secondary, tertiary contacts, which parts of the building need to be sanitized, whether it's the entire building or part thereof. And what we really have noticed over the last couple of weeks is that a large we have seen some infections coming from the work, workplaces. You've pointed out government plaza as being an example. But um, of course, even in the Ministry of Health, we have seen cases in different departments, um, Trinidad Public Health Lab, as you may know. So different divisions, we're now seeing infections in the workplace occurring. And we take it on a case-to-case -case basis based on the, the contacts, the nature of the contact. Of course, what we are seeing and what we don't like is that persons are still coming to work ill. So if we are picking up the cases and persons not presenting with symptoms, the chance of spreading in that organization is low. So we, we're just calling again on everyone. If you do have symptoms, please stay home. Wear your mask at all times. And we're seeing people congregating in lunchrooms, um, sometimes even sitting at your desk um, in close proximity to someone else. Somebody comes into your space, your cubicle space, and they're not wearing their mask. Please put on your mask at that point in time. So wear your mask at all times possible. And don't congregate in the in the communal spaces where you have your mask down and your guard is down when you're eating, etc. Thank you, CMO, for reinforcing those points. We now move to IETV. <coughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Be Nemi here's IETV News. I have two quick questions. My first question is to the minister. Minister, I know last week you said that Sinopharm is supposed to be approved by the end of April. Do you have any updates on that? And how ca soon can we expect any sorts of correspondence for those vaccines? My second question would go to the CMO. CMO saying that we are reporting more and more cases of the COVID, the Brazilian variant. Um, is our healthcare, is our parallel healthcare system prepared for that? We are seeing what's happening in India. So here in TNT, do we have a backup plan? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the issue of Sinopharm, Sinopharm's um, entry into Trinidad and Tobago as a vaccine is dependent on WHO, EUA or EUL, which is expected, as we have been told, all things being equal by the end of April. So hopefully WHO is probably um, pondering and looking at that now. When, if and when it receives EUA or EUL, then I'll be able to uh, give you more information as to correspondence and dates. I will take part of the second question. We meet as a team three times a week. Our meeting this morning before coming here dealt squarely with the second question you asked about plan B. Yes, we do have a plan B and we have a plan C. Currently in Coover, we are using one tower, which is the pediatric tower. We are playing 
close attention to not only the gross number of cases per day, and I think the seven-day rolling average, we asked this 116. point, is 117? 116. 116. We pay close attention to that number. But as far as hospitalizations are concerned, we also pay attention to the number of people coming into the hospitals. We have a backup plan to activate the adult tower in Coover in case our numbers go up. Right now, we are only using the pediatric tower. So that's plan B. Plan C is that if we need more capacity, then we take back ARIMA. You would recall we released ARIMA um, as a COVID positive hospital for the people of ARIMA currently being used. Plan C is, and I hope it doesn't come to that, so I'm asking the population to help us by wearing your masks, social distancing, all the usual things, to make sure ARIMA stays for the people of ARIMA. So that is plan B, to activate the adult tower, uh, another 100 beds with ICU, HDU capacity. The good thing now is that most of the patients being admitted, as we heard this morning from the team when we met, when we met are ambulatory patients, most of them. So that's, that's a good sign. But yes, there's a plan B and a plan C. So thank you very much. I dealt with it. No, that's Would, fine. That's fine. Okay. All right, we now go to I-95. Good morning, everyone. Whitfield Turner from I-95.5 CMO. I'd just like to uh, clarify an issue as it pertains to the gen sequencing. So we have a known positive who is a primary contact of a previous positive case and that previous positive case uh, actually had one of the variants is it that that known positive now would then be priorit prioritized for gen sequencing and for minister dial singh the tobago business chamber has made repeated calls over the recent weeks for prioritizing the vaccination of the Tobago population. And they've been saying that with a view to getting business as close as possible back to normal, and also with a view to reopening the borders via Tobago. Is that proposal something that you are willing to consider at this time? Question first. So the issue of opening borders as we constantly state at these press conferences is ultimately a decision made by the Honorable Prime Minister um, after he considers all factors. I cannot say at this point in time if and when the borders are open in the way that the public um, imagines it. As far as vaccinating people, we are adhering as far as humanly possible to the COVAX principles of vaccinating healthcare workers, persons over 60, this age group bears the brunt of fatalities. So you want to protect their lives. We started to dip in to some persons in phase two, for example, MPs, parliamentarians, local government, um, judiciary, media, and so on. So these policies have stood us in good stead and um, there's a national plan, and we will stick to that national plan until vaccines become more readily available, and then we could open it up to the whole population in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Whitfield. Okay, yeah, so in terms of the that question related to who gets the gene sequencing um, with the positive patient, so we have a couple of cases of similar where you have the primary contact, the, the person being P1, meaning Brazilian variant, and a, a known primary contact is now testing positive. We have about two or three cases of that. What we anticipate is those people will be P1 as well. So we're treating them as P1 presumptively. The samples are going across to the via the normal route, TPHL, CAFA, UWI, and of course we have that liaison to let them know that it is suspect P1 and they will do the necessary prioritization on the UE side for us.
So that's how we take those cases, deal with those cases. Thank you very much, CMO. TV6, we are ready for your questions. Morning, Urvashi from TV6. Um, yesterday in the Senate, um, Minister Dial Singh would have reconfirmed that the first P1 case was that of a Venezuelan migrant. Are you able to say if that person would have entered legally or illegally? And how many contacts did he or she have? Because the assumption we're going with is that if they did enter illegally, the average boat will carry about 30 occupants. Secondly, uh, Minister Dial saying just to confirm, we have no confirmed vaccines in terms of invoices, payments, and arrival dates. And are you concerned about the supply chain of vaccines at this point in time? The person is a legal or illegal immigrant rest with national security we would have um, supplied the name of the person and national security will make that determination on the issue of vaccine supply chain as i have said several times we have confirmed with paho that another 33,600 um, astrazeneca vaccines will be coming into the country in may so there is no concern right now. And then after that, I had a meeting with Dr. Erica Wheeler again. Um, another batch of vaccines will be coming in. We don't have a time as yet to complete our first tranche of 100,000. So under COVAX, we are getting 100,000. So let's say COVAX 1 was 33,600, which we have used. COVAX 2... 33,600, which is coming in in May, and then COVAX 3, the balance to make up the 100,000 will come sometime after me. So as we stand now, as we stand now, hear my words carefully, things can change. As we stand now, we are not overly concerned about supply chain. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we now go to AZP. AZP News. Hi, good morning, Prime Bihari, AZPnews.com. Uh, Minister, I just want to go back to this whole issue about the people over 60 with NCDs, the frontline healthcare workers. Are you satisfied that enough of these people who were on the initial priority list of the government um, did receive the vaccine? Because AZP News has um, at least one case where a 67-year-old gentleman who is diabetic and, and he has some heart disease he was refused the vaccine, although he had a letter from his doctor. And he is saying, and a lot of other people are saying that they, they have witnessed a lot of young people going and getting the vaccines where um, the people who really deserved it, who were on the priority list, didn't get it. So that's my first question. And my second question, maybe to the CMO, CMO there are, um, the doctors that call patients on a daily basis, there are reports that, that they might be overwhelmed with the number of patients they have to call. In some instances, we know that um, they have um, two and three doctors have to call over 200 patients a day, and it seems to be an impossible task. I don't know if there's anything that can be done in that case, in, in those scenarios. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. I will ask the CEO of, um, of Northwest to talk about the operations. Um, prior, you have to understand as minister i manage the national rollout i wouldn't have individual information of 41,000 individuals however if you have any information as i always advise the media that any patient is disadvantaged you send it to us confidentially the name and phone number of the person and prior we will look into it but raised in this forum, I will never have an answer, right? It is not the policy of the government to refuse a vaccine to anyone over 60 who has a confirmed appointment, okay? But if you have that type of information, the sooner you could send it to us, we could investigate it, and certainly we'll do our best to make sure that particular individual is not disadvantaged. I will now turn you over to the CEO to answer the other parts of the question. Uh, hi, good morning again. Uh, so we would have made tremendous efforts to ensure that our NCD patients who would have expressed an interest in taking the vaccine 
would have received appointments both on their NCD clinic days as well as their non-NCD clinic days to access those vaccines, in addition to which at our mass vaccination and even at our health centers before the mass vaccination site was operationalized, we never turned away anyone who fit the national criteria. Um, I have no other information as it relates to that particular individual you spoke about, but that has been our policy that once they met the national criteria, even uh, if they did not present with an appointment on the day, we would have tried our best to facilitate them while we were also concurrently facilitating our appointments on the given day at whatever site we were operationalizing at that given time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Prior, thank you, Ms. Bash. Prior, could you repeat your second question? There are a, um, the, the doctors that follow up on patients on a daily basis um, um, at the various RHAs, uh, um, for, for example, I'm told that they overwhelm, for example, there are two and three doctors that have to deal with 200, something like 300 patients a day. And, they are, and it's, very, it's an impossible task for them to contact these patients. So, and yeah, so, they, they yeah it is, it is a, a quite daunting task to have to call persons usually twice a day with the number of staff that we have at the different CMHs. I had reached out to my chief public health inspector earlier this week, actually, um, to see if we can utilize the public health inspectors themselves to assist with this task. So in each, for example, in each county, there's anywhere between 10 and 13 public health inspectors. Um, so we may be using them once we get the nod from the chief public health inspector later this week in some form or fashion to assist in that regard. So it is something that we have noted and we are, we are, we are trying to deal with that capacity issue. Thank you for your questions, EZP. Uh, we now go to Newsday. Good morning, Narissa Fraser from the Newsday. Um, can we get an update on the number of ventilators that we have available for COVID-19 patients? And uh, for the year thus far, have we had many of those patients needing to be on ventilators? Okay, thank you. So in the initial stages of the pandemic, you may recall this issue of ventilators was top and center around the world. At that time, I would have indicated that in the country, we had over 100 ventilators across the system. We acquired more ventilators with time. Ventilators were donated. And for the COVID response, we had over 70 ventilators dedicated to COVID. You may recall when Dr. Parkinson um, was here and I gave the statistic at no point in time did we ever have to use more than 10 CMO, that's correct? Prior, About, to, prior, to now, yes. prior to now, we never had to use more than 10 ventilators out of the stock of over 70 dedicated to COVID. So there is no question about the shortage of ventilators or any patient who needs a ventilator not being able to access a ventilator. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that response. We now go to 98.1. Good morning to the panel, and uh, thank you again, Mr. Alexander. Uh, Stephen Cummings here, 98.1 FM. Uh, two questions uh, quickly, and uh, those questions, um, I believe, can be uh, addressed by uh, Minister Dayal Singh. Uh, Minister, um, in terms of, uh, you always, you know, um, from a policy viewpoint, and you have always, you know, made that point that you are, um, you know, responsible uh, mainly for policy. Um, would a community mobile system be of value in general terms uh, when we're talking, the, our, talking about our vaccination rollout program for Trinidad and Tobago, in addition to the stationary sites that we have already mapped, bearing in mind that they are vulnerable persons within far-reached areas, especially the elderly, who may not um, even have the luxury of being close to a health center. And uh, secondly, are there any further um, plans or considerations for further adjustments to the public health regulations um, you know, at this time? Because we have been seeing um, 100, 100 plus um, you know, infections over the past um, uh, few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for both questions. Yes, we have considered through the RHAs how we are going to reach those vulnerable persons, shut-ins, 
um, those with disabilities and so on. I have also reached out to my colleague, Minister Donna Cox, under her Ministry of Social Development and Family Services, to give me a list of all the agencies and bodies that she has under her remit, so that when the time comes, we will try as much as humanly possible to go to these people instead of having them come to us. It is currently within our consideration in phase three that when we reach that stage, there are some who could come to us. So we would ask them who have transport to come to us. Then we, have, we could take them off the list. And those who really can't come to us, we go to them. I have indicated before that I asked for a study to be done. And I did give it out last week, how we, um, how we vaccinate people like with mental disease and so on. Um, the question of informed consent uh, becomes a legal question that we have to look at. So there are plans to reach out to vulnerable communities wherever they are under the auspices of the RHAs. On the question of further adjustments, as I indicated several times, further adjustments are the prerogative of the Honorable Prime Minister. When he meets with us, we present him with data. So I can't say yay or nay at this point in time because that is not my remit. The Honorable Prime Minister makes those final decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Media. Thank you, Minister. We now go to GML for your first follow-up question. All right. Thank you again, everyone. Um, I, CMO, I don't know if you could expound a bit on what the Minister would have indicated throughout this press conference there. He would have given us some idea as to the plans, like a plan B, a plan C, the ventilators. Could you give us a more detailed breakdown of how many bed spaces we have within the parallel healthcare system at this moment. Um, when these plans are in, um, engaged, how many more would that capacity be built? How many spaces we have within the ICUs and the HDU, HDUs within Cora and Kuva? that kind of logistical breakdown? Yeah, just, just to give you an average. So when we get the adult tower up and running, it will give us about 100 plus beds additionally. That's the adult tower at Kuva. Um, Cora, as you know, can scale up all the way up to close to 100 as well. Augustus Long, we're looking at around 40 to 50. And then Arima, at its maximum capacity, if we have to go back down that road, is close to 100 as well. Um, most of these have about 10% of the bed space capacity-wise for ICU slash HDU. So if you work those figures, those are some rough ideas of what we're dealing with in terms of scale. All right, so I have some yeah. more. Mm -hmm. I you. went into my WhatsApp from Dr. Richards, mm -hmm. who manages this so hospital capacity currently mm -hmm. 320 we currently use 90 no sorry hospital capacity 411 we currently have 91 patients is that correct yeah i'll tell you the exact number tell me so the exact between number. tobago and trinidad we have 152 97 at coover right so 97 at coover icu um, we currently have 39 spaces. We are currently using nine. Arima is off the grid. So if Arima has to mm -hmm. come in, that gives you another 100 beds with ICU capacity, HDU capacity. What we do at the ministry is, ma is manage the overall capacity. Um, so that is what we are looking at. And as I said, the good thing right now is that most of the cases are ambulatory cases, which is good. So right now, we're in a good position. We meet again on Friday to discuss the latest numbers. And plan B is to operationalize the adult tower. And if it comes to that, then we have to take back a REMA. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking the population, don't let us reach that stage. So we're in a good place right now with hospital capacity. And then we also have, um, we also have Augustus. San Fernando, um, Augustus Long, Augustus Long mm -hmm. right? So we're in a good place as far as hospital capacity is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. TV6, we are ready for your question. 
Thank you again. Minister, I'm going to ask you to revisit your um, answer to me and please explain to me how the legal or illegal status of that first P1 case is a matter of national security. When if that person did come in illegally, there could likely be scores of other persons possibly infected spread throughout the country, living in what data shows are cramped conditions with a mutant strain of this virus. And we're all already seeing a 22% infection in Victoria. Please explain. Thank you. Well, I think um, you answered the question brilliantly yourself. Mm -hmm. You said it's a matter of national security. So that's why we made the information available to the Minister of National Security. What we do at the Ministry of Health is to do the contact tracing, and that information can also be shared with national security. So I think the question has been asked and the question has been answered. Thank you for joining us for today's media conference. We really do appreciate that you take the time to view these conferences every week. Remember, we are all in this together. We urge everyone to do their part to, to, to safeguard the health of our nation. Be safe and enjoy the rest of your day. And please remember the three W's. Wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. This is TTT.